Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. For those of you that like to get to the juicy story where you have the straightforward Bigfoot encounter, well, I've got that for you on this channel right now. But the full stories are really worth listening to. And I've got them listed at the bottom because really just the Bigfoot encounter without the whole experience from the beginning to the middle and the end is really worth listening to. But if you just want to get to the juicy encounter that people have sent in to me, by all means, here are a few examples of them right now on my channel. So get straight into the business, shall we? And let's get started. To my amazement, I was grabbing a bunch of hair, which I assumed was a warm coat of some kind that an Olivia's brother was wearing, as rather strange one at that, I might add. Got him, Olivia, I cried. Your brother is over here. I've got him. I noticed Hank's strange fluffy coat smelt funky like he'd not bathed for a long while, which didn't surprise me at all because the reputations of little boys, I knew they would evade bathing at all costs. My friend came close with her flashlight, and the light lit up what we all believed was Hank. Much to our amazement and horror, it was not the mischievous Hank that I was actually holding down, but a terrified humanoid ape-like creature covered in long flowing dark hair. I immediately retracted my hand hold instantly, hardly daring to believe what I'd been pinning down. This curious anonymous creature was about seventy pounds, one foot wide and three foot tall, and it was covered all over its body with hair. It possessed a hairless long leathery face and was eyeing us with terrified eyes and looked just like a deer caught in headlights. I realised that this curious funny little creature with a naughty sense of humour had been playing with us, but now that we'd actually caught him, he appeared to be very scared, reticent and exceedingly shy. Suddenly we heard the most terrifying sound that sounded like a herd of rhinos gallivanting towards us at a hundred miles an hour. Whatever this thing was, it was faster than a cheetah and swifter than the wind. It bolted unhesitantly towards us with defiant feisty determination and whatever this criter was, it was charging towards her youngling with a worrisome, rather frantic look on her face. The creature was clearly the young one's mother, because it was very obvious by how protective, assertive and maternal she appeared. She let out a long stream of monkey-like chattering that sounded like she was giving her youngling a piece of her mind and reprimanding him ever so severely. I could see the little creature looking sheepish, as if he knew he had misbehaved. The female criter grabbed her youngling, who proceeded to climb up his mother's back and sit with one leg dangling on either side of her shoulders. Suddenly the creature's reticence dissipated, and he sat there looking very jubilant, elated, and exceedingly pleased with himself. The mother glanced at us very briefly with a wary expression on her face that resembled an exhausted, exasperated mother who just about had enough of her child. Then she darted away very hurriedly. I sensed she didn't appreciate be being seen by us. We watched her moving like greased lightning, and with such seamless grace. All the while she was chattering in a monkey kind of language that sounded like a mother giving her kid a huge telling off. I had not seen the mother very clearly, but she looked like a human, only with long flowing dark hair. But she was elephantine in size. I would say she was ten feet tall, nine hundred pounds, and four foot wide with very overlong arms that fell well below her knees. I could tell she was exceedingly sinewy and muscular, and had a very distinct cone-shaped head, and in her expressive deep-set dark eyes I observed a very distinctive red eye shine in the dark. "'What the heck was that?' asked Olivia excitedly. "'What was it? What did we see? What was it?' "'I have no idea,' I said. Everybody started to talk all at once. We were so excited.' We were in rapturous awe. What did we see? We kept asking each other. What did we see? This was amazing. Look what I found, I said, showing everyone a large deerskin filled with acorns. This was what the criter was throwing at us. He was a naughty little thing. We all marvelled at what we'd actually seen, and when we told our parents about our amazing encounter, our parents unambiguously dismissed our claims and emphatically ascertained that we'd been tricked by someone in a gorilla costume or we'd seen a bear, but we had not observed what we claimed to have seen. All of us kids were quite simply disbelieved 
dismissed and misunderstood, but we all knew what we had seen, and it was not an Abe costume, nor by any strength of the imagination was it a bear. I think we all felt so frustrated and infuriated that no one believed our story, so we only talked about the encounter among ourselves, as everybody else clearly did not believe a word we said, and seemed to think that everything we said was fictitious and spurious. One Sunday evening my friends were smoking at a gravesite. We tended to pick a place to sit at random, as Olivia believed it was nice of us to sit around a gravesite that had not been visited for years by a solitary soul. She thought it was a kind, generous thing for us to do, as the dead person was long since departed and their memory had died along with them. I think they might enjoy our company, she would say. I thought it was a very odd idea, but Olivia was very influential. What a sad grave, said Olivia, sitting down on the grass and studying the grave curiously. She was using her flashlight to observe the grave closely. Look, the engraving has all be but been weathered away by time, and there is moss growing all over it, and the tombstone is so lopsided. It must be from the 1800s or before then, I said. Probably before then, said Olivia. Paula, one of my girlfriends, looked reflected as she started taking a puff of her cigarette. Do you think we'll ever get to see that awesome human ape again? she asked. That little creature was so naughty and cute. I can't believe you actually thought it was Hank when you were pinning him down, she said to me. It's amazing it didn't fight you back or run away or even bite you. I'm surprised it didn't bolt away, I admitted. I thought it would run away too when I saw what it was. It just seemed to cower in submission and it seemed really afraid. I don't think we'll ever see them again, said Olivia, reaching for a cigarette and taking a puff. No, I think that mother's going to keep a stern eye on her little one from now on. I'm pretty sure of that. I could sense she wasn't pleased with the poor little criter. He only wanted to play tricks on us, but I don't think he intended to be spotted by us. We were talking for a long time, and three of the five girls were smoking copious amounts of cigarettes and stubbing them out on the earth around the tombstone, creating a messing ashtray in the ground that was very unsightly and untidy. Suddenly I felt very certain that something was watching us. I could feel eyes on me, and I looked up to see this man stand, standing yards away at us, goggling at us with a very annoyed look on his face. "'There's a man watching us,' I said. "'Over there. Can you see?' Look, there by the cedar tree. I did not hear him come into the cemetery, said Olivia, looking up at the man in surprise. How odd! You'd have thought we'd have heard him. I remember thinking the man was behaving very strangely, and his face looked unusually pale and white, and very distorted, and he looked like he was wearing a very, very heavy winter coat that rather reminded me of the German coats that were worn in World War II, which was strangely odd, because it wasn't even cold. The man stared at us for a moment longer, and then he appeared to disappear in the woods, which was also odd, because you don't exit the cemetery through the woods. Wow, I said, did you see that? He went through the woods. I wonder where he came from, asked Olivia. Did anybody see? It appeared that no one had observed a thing. We thought nothing more about the incident until the next morning when Olivia informed me that she was woken in the middle of the night to find her bed shaking violently. For a moment she thought there was an earthquake, but she was soon to realise nothing else was rattling in her home, which she found incredibly odd. She reluctantly returned to bed, and found her bed shaking all over again. So she looked up in alarm, and at the very end of her bed she saw the man from the graveside, who was standing there ogling her like he did at the cemetery. But then he vanished before her eyes, literally dematerialising. One second he was there, and then he was gone in a flash. I was so freaked out because I realised he had to be a ghost, she told me. We could not understand why the ghost had actually followed Olivia home, but the very next day it was Paula's turn to have an outer-worldly encounter. She claimed that in the middle of the night she felt something was sitting on top of her body, and it felt so heavy that for a moment she was struggling to breathe because the pressure on her ch chest was so huge. She screamed when she looked up, and then she observed the man from the cemetery but she only saw his head and shoulders hovering above her body with a very disgruntled look on his face. He looked as mad as hell. I've never been so terrified in all my life, she told us. I ran to my parents' bedroom, and I couldn't go back to my bedroom. It did seem weird that the ghost of the man from the graveyard had visited two of my friends, but I was to discover he had not finished with his visitations yet. 
The final person to be visited by the ghost was my friend Kate. She said she was fast asleep when she was awoken to someone violently shaking her body so hard as if they were trying to get her attention and wake her up. She got up in alarm, thinking that the house must be on fire or something, to see what was going on, and there she saw these shoulders and arms and a head of a man from the graveyard floating around the room like a hot air balloon, and she said he looked furious, and suddenly she found herself being pelted with cigarette stubs, and then the ghost just vanished and dematerialized before her eyes. We examined the cigarette stubs that had been thrown at Kate's, over Kate's bed, and we could see some of them had Olivia's black lipstick marks on the end, so we knew where they came from. I think we were sitting at the grave of the man that died there, and our smoking and leaving our stubs at the graveside upset him, so he visited those of us that were smoking to raise his objection, said Olivia. I think we unintentionally disrespected him from beyond the grave by littering his gravesite with our stubs. This is the reason he visited those of us that smoke. I'm sure that's what upset him. What else on earth could it be? I suggested we went back to the grave the following evening to apologise and make amends and clean the area around the grave. I even cut some white roses from my mother's garden and placed them around the grave. One day I decided to start driving my truck at night because it had been a hellish brutal summer with unrelenting heat and despite the air conditioning in my truck I was getting fed up with driving in these tiring conditions and so I decided to give nighttime driving my full attention which is exactly what I invariably did. Driving at night was not without its sets back, I promise you, as visibility is greatly reduced and services from dispatch are less reliable. However, I began enjoying driving at night because I could drive to my own destinations a lot quicker without the inevitable daytime hold-ups that swallow your time like whales with plankton. It was also cooler in the summer months, driving at night, which I tend to prefer. One night at about four in the morning, to be precise, I saw this figure walking next to the guardrail. It was the statue of a swelt woman, dressed in what appeared to be 1800s clothes. I didn't know this at the time, but after I did research online, I discovered the dress fitted the 1800s time period almost perfectly. She appeared to be wearing this long flowing dark russet dress that fell above her ankles, in it, and it appeared to have a very elegant high neckline and long sleeves. I remember thinking she was quite smartly attired, but what was she doing walking about at four o'clock in the morning and being naturally protective towards women as I am, I pulled over to the side of the road to ensure that she was all right, because that's what a chivalrous gentleman would do. Lady, I said, it's not safe for you to be walking around this early in the morning when it's so dark outside. Can I drop you off to your home? For a moment, the lady appeared to hesitate, and then reluctantly she stepped into the truck and sat reclined in the passenger seat next to me. I noticed she possessed a very graceful countenance and her posture was impeccably straight. I also noticed that her appearance was rather unusual. It appeared that she had very long brown hair that had been braided on the sides and had been bra and she even had a braided bun and some deliberate areas of loose hair strands that fell back below her shoulders that were clearly part of the attractive hairstyle that looked like she would would be something a bride would attempt on her wedding day, but not for an everyday occasion. So where am I taking you to? I asked. I'll show you the way, she said, indicating for me to drive straight ahead, which invariably I did. Do you mind me asking what you're doing outside so late at night? I asked. I'm looking for Musky, she said, suddenly growing very alarmed. I cannot find Musky anywhere. Sorry, you've got me, I said. Who is Musky? Musky, she said. Musky is my little white dog. I cannot find him anywhere. What am I going to do? Suddenly the strange lady started to sob. I cannot find Musky, she repeated. I've looked everywhere for him, she cried, sounding so distressed. Barker says he's run away from home and is never ever coming back. How could he say something so cruel and heartless? I grabbed a tissue for the woman and turned around to give it to her, but she was gone. Now remember, I'd been driving and had turned away for half a second, and in a flash of light, the woman had just vanished. That wasn't even physically possible. It had happened far too quickly. For a long moment, I could not fathom what could have happened to her, because the lady sitting next to me had been as vividly real as you and I are. And I mean physically real. It wasn't like she was half there, or ghost-like in any way. But there was no conceivable way for her to just jump out of my truck 
without me knowing about it. I realised in a moment of shocked revelation that this woman must have been a ghost. But how can something so physically real be a ghost? But what else could she have been? As I continued to drive a few yards down the road, I saw the strange woman walking on the side of the road all over again, and I was so rattled and freaked out. The anomalous woman turned around and waved at me with a warm smile on her face, and she was lifting up the little white poodle to show me that she had actually found little Muskie. I tell you, she freaked me out so much that I just hightailed it down that highway as fast as I could. I know she was a benign, friendly ghost, but the experience nevertheless freaked me out and was something I have never been able to fathom or understand because she had to be a ghost. Of that I am certain. I had never believed in ghosts before, but if they were real, which they clearly are, I never imagined that they would appear as physically real as you or I are. It does lead me to ponder how many of us may have encountered ghosts among us without even knowing that they're actually ghosts. On one occasion at quarter past twelve at night, I noticed that there was this large figure standing in the middle of the road, and I realised at once it was a woman in a long fur coat, appearing to be bent over and examining something in the road, so I immediately got out of the truck to see whether she was all right. Imagine my amazement when she looked up at me, and I realised she was not a woman at all, but a creature covered from top to toe in long flowing auburn hair. She was standing over a smaller creature who was clearly her youngling, who was covered in hair, and he had big padded foot, but a massive piece of glass was literally lodged in his foot, and he was whimpering in agonising pain. This larger creature was trying to remove the glass from the little one's padded foot, foot, but whenever she touched the corner of the glass, the little creature would slap her and let out a warning dog-like growl, because I imagine it hurt terribly much. At that moment I forgot that those creatures weren't human, I don't know why, but I just did, and immediately sprang into action. Maybe it's because I did work on a stint with the ambulance service for a while, and I just knew how to react in adverse situations. I quickly rushed to my truck and brought out a large bag of ice and my medical supply kit, and I bounded towards the hairy creatures in the middle of the road, very, very confidently, not worrying at, uh, at all about my safety, because I didn't even think about it. I immediately took charge of the situation, and for some extraordinary unexplained reason, the creature just permitted me to help them, which I'll never, ever understand why. I placed the block of ice around the whole area of the wound in order to numb the area for a good five minutes, and then I put my hand on the glass and pulled it out in a second, and the youngling was so surprised because it hadn't felt any pain at all, and it let out such a happy little whoop as if to say, Mummy, it didn't hurt! The two creatures were amazed that I'd got out the piece of glass. The mother took the glass fragment from me in her hand to examine it with one of her large sausage-sized fingers. She appeared to be absolutely fascinated by the glass. I could see she was testing it for sharpness as she wanted to study what had injured her youngling, and you could tell she was not pleased with the piece of glass that had harmed her baby like this. I disinfected the wound and wiped away any excess blood and then layered a bandage around the little youngling's foot, which was different to a human foot in the way that the large toe did not align straight with the rest of the toes. The feet were human-like, but much more padded underneath, and much more like a cat's paws, rarely spongy and thick. When the bandage was on the youngling's foot, he became so excited, he kept admiring it like we would admire a brand new pair of shoes. He kept lifting his foot to the left and to the right to examine the bandage, and he was thrilled with his new accessory, and thought it was the most wonderful, exciting thing to wear. He kept showing it off to his mother. The little jubilant creature got up and managed to walk, and he found that he could walk easily on his foot, which clearly astounded and delighted him, and once again he made an ecstatic whooping sound to express his appreciation. I was surprised to see Zack, my cat, sitting on the opposite side of the road, watching everything transpire with a curious interest, and then he started to groom himself, which showed me that he was perfectly comfortable in this creature's presence, which was in itself quite amazing. For a second the two creatures stood on the side of the road, chattering excitedly backwards and forwards in a monkey language, and then they glanced briefly at me and chatted at backwards and forwards again. I knew they were discussing me, and they sounded very excited. 
I really got the impression that they perceived me much like you would perceive an angel that comes to your rescue, helping in a critical moment in time. They really were looking on me as an angel. The Critus looked at me, nodded as if to say thank you, and glided off the guardrail down the embankment to the vast area of forest below. When they moved, I was in utter awe, because they appeared to float with a seamless grace. I was mind-blown by those creatures. What on earth were they, I wondered in amazement. I'd never seen or heard of a creature like this before. At a guess, I'd say the large creature was about eight foot tall, six hundred pounds and four foot wide, while the youngling must have been about four foot. As I said, they were covered with long auburn hair that reminded me of a red fox, although the hair was human-like in its texture. These creatures were very human-like in form, only much, much larger than a human, and infinitely more muscular with huge shoulders and overlong arms. The head was shaped like a bullet, but the hairless, leathery, pinky-grey face was long, and they had very deep-set brown eyes, a prominent brow ridge, a flat nose, and a very slender mouth. I could not be sure if the taller creature was feminine, female, as I had never noticed her breasts, but I am pretty sure she was because she possessed a very maternal feminine energy. It did not even occur to me to be frightened of these creatures, because they were so gentle and serene, and so human-like that it was absolutely natural to help them. Who described the sound as very mechanical and exceedingly unsettling, and the noise went on for about 45 long minutes. Even more extraordinary was that one of the locals found a large circular burnt-out area in a wooded clearing while he was out walking his dogs in the woods. It was quite literally a cookie-cutter size of a colossal flying saucer that was burnt out in the grass. It was all very peculiar, and nobody knew what to make of it. Was this connected to the black-eyed children? I don't know, but I do know that they want you to invite them in, and when you do that I'm almost certain that something very nefarious and very awful will happen to you. As Alice so eloquently put it, those are the devil's children, and I wholeheartedly agree, because there is no other way to describe them. Are those black-eyed children connected to grey aliens? I believe they are, but I guess that subject is open for debate. One day I got a call from a frantic resident to tell us that her son Stephen had gone missing in the woods, and he had been playing with his brother Philip, and then he just vanished during their game, and Philip didn't know where on earth he'd gone. Philip was in a dreadful commotion because his brother had vanished before his very eyes, and his mother was hysterical. We set out with a large search party to look for Philip, but we couldn't find him anywhere for three long days, and he was registered as missing and presumed dead. Three days later he suddenly appeared from absolutely nowhere, and he had an extraordinary story to account. I had no reason to doubt that at the time he begged me not to tell anyone his amazing story, for fear of being disbelieved or ridiculed, and this was his account as he described it to me. My brother and I were playing in the woods using our slingshots. I quickly ran to a section of the woods to relieve myself, and I remember losing my balance, slipping and then somersaulting down this large hollow opening in the ground that was covered and concealed by dense overgrown shrubbery that you would never have known was there unless you'd actually seen it. It may have been part of an old mine shaft, I'm not sure. I must have hit my head really badly because it was throbbing violently and bleeding profusely. I do remember drifting in and out of consciousness. I also vaguely recall that Stephen was calling out for me, but I tried to answer him, and then I think I lost consciousness all over again, because everything after that went blank. I must have blacked out for a long while, how long I have no idea, but I do remember waking up and stirring very slowly, and finding myself in this strange hollow, and everything was very foggy and blurry and confusing for me at the time. I was disorientated and very muddled. It was like I'd lost my short-term memory for a while. I couldn't understand how I'd got into this hollow, nor could I remember how I'd got here in the first place. I tried to climb out of this mine, but it was too deep for me to get out of it, so I was stuck there, and I kept calling out for help, but no one came to my rescue, and no one heard my desperate calls, and I screamed out for a very long time until I was completely hoarse and had almost lost my voice. I became very distraught and frightened, because I was all alone in this dark shaft. My head was still hurting, but my memory did come flooding back finally, and I suddenly remembered my fall, and how I'd ended up in this deep hollow in the first place. 
I felt hungry and thirsty and tired, and my dry mouth was parched because I was so thirsty. I was longing for a drink. I kept holding on to my, the vain hope that my family would come looking for me, so I called out again and again, but no one was answering my calls. I felt horribly alone and quite frightened to be truthful. Suddenly I saw this humongous hand pull back the undergrowth like a curtain and tear it away. And then I saw this huge cone-shaped face peering down at me with, a go uh, with an agog look on its hairless leathery face. It looked shocked and surprised, but the face was so human, and yet it wasn't human at the same time. What on earth was this strange creature, I was wondering to myself, because it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It had a very distinct brow ridge, a flat nose, a slender mouth, and a very deep-set, treacle-coloured pair of eyes that were actually quite warm and friendly, if I say so myself. I wanted to scream because for a moment I felt like a deer that was ensnared in a lion's den, and that this dangerous apex predator was staring at me as if it was I was a quick, easy, appetising snack. But I did realise by the look that this clearly wasn't the case. The creature wasn't at all aggressive, but seemed amused to see me caught up in the old mine shaft, and if I didn't know any better, I could swear it was chuckling and laughing at me. I noticed the creature's eyes were incredibly warm, friendly and kind, without an ounce of animosity, so I immediately lost my fear and relaxed. I did try to ask the creature for help by explaining that I was stuck in this mine shaft. Suddenly the creature jumped down to the area where I was sitting, and he landed at the bottom of the shaft, literally with the agility of a domestic cat. He had no problems landing on the ground. I was fascinated and realised that the creature had heavily padded human-like feet with a slightly angled large toe, and the feet were very human but humongous. I noticed also that the creature was agile and graceful, although very colossal in size, much bigger than a black bear. I would say she was about nine foot tall, nine hundred pounds and four foot wide, and she was covered with long flowing auburn hair that I remember thinking to myself was a particularly beautiful colour. I noticed her breasts were covered in hair, and her overlong arms hung well below her knees, so I imagined she could run very easily on all fours as easily as on two feet. I also noticed that her physique was incredibly powerful, very impressive and strong, especially her colossal shoulders that were very gargantuan. The creature grabbed a huge stone, and with it she hammered into the side of the rocky miney shaft with such brute strength that she was able to make some large footholds in the wall. For a human to attempt to do that would have been very difficult, but for her it was with effortless ease. A human would have had to use a very powerful axe, or something probably electronic. As she made the footholds in the wall, she would perch on one foothold while effortlessly balancing her whole body on one foot, while she used the stone to make a series of footholds several feet apart until it reached the opening of the shaft. She picked me up in her arms and placed me over her shoulders as if I weighed absolutely nothing, and before I knew it I was lifted out of the shaft. How she did it I have no idea, but she was so quick and efficient. She then placed me on the ground and made a few chattering sounds, and then like grease lightning she disappeared into the forest, leaving me there. I could not believe that this creature had helped me like this. She was beautiful, majestic and lofty, and quite literally had saved my life, because I do not know if I would have ever been found in that mine shaft if she had not answered my frantic calls, so I am so, so grateful that she did. After my experience with the black-eyed kids, I was not dismissive of this boy's claims, but I told him that he was never to tell anybody about what had happened, because I knew that there were people out there in our community who would not believe his story and would laugh at him, and I knew, even though I knew his story was true. One evening when I was called out to a family who swore they'd seen a dark shadow loitering around in their backyard and they were afraid, and had heard a strange noise that they described as a series of whooping sounds. As I parked my car, I went straight to the family's backyard with my flashlight to see if I could investigate that black shadow they'd been talking about. Suddenly I heard this whooping sound, and then I saw the small three-foot creature covered in auburn hair that looked absolutely terrified to see me, and it quickly ran away, shimming up an oak tree in the yard, trying to hide. Suddenly I heard a very distinct whooping sound, and then the little creature, 
was looking at me through the trees in a worrisome way, but then it decided to rush down the tree like a fireman on his pole, and it thundered past me at a thousand miles an hour like a rhino, and it raced towards a tall figure covered in auburn hair that fitted the boy's description perfectly of the strange creature that had rescued him from the mine shaft. I think this could have been the one creature that had saved him. I got the impression that the little one had got lost and called out to his mother for help with those strange whooping sounds. The little hairy humanoid creature whimpered in delight to see his mother and jumped on her back and off they went. For a second she looked at me with her treacle-coloured eyes. I remember thinking, wow, you're magnificent, whatever you are because the creature was majestic, lofty, powerful and beautiful, and when she moved she was so graceful and as fast as a cheetah. I was so in awe of her. So there we are. That's the juicy bits of our stories tonight. I personally think you should go back and listen to the whole story because it makes it so much more exciting, because then you learn all about where it happened, the location, and all about the fabulous characters involved in the story, and that makes the story so much more gripping. But as I say so, go down to the description and then click on to the YouTube link and then you will hear the whole story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.